habits by James Clear. James Clear figured out that it's not us that messes up, it's the systems that we're trying to deal with that, that, um, that get off track. So the idea is to hack your systems or what he means by systems is our habits. So the idea is that we can use insights about how our brain and work, body work to shape our behavior in ways in the direction that we want, what he refers to as atomic habits. And one of the ways to do that is the one minute rule. The idea is that you decide on the habit you want to establish. So I'll give you an example. Um, I walk my dog every morning, but I want to, I want to start stretching every day, at least a little bit, right? But I don't do the stretching. And I get back from my walk this morning and I hear my mind, I, I hear myself say, why don't you do a little stretching? And my mind says, I don't want it. I don't feel like it, which is always what it is. We're just not going to feel like it. In general, we don't feel like it. So then I thought, okay, the one minute rule. So I said, okay, I'll stretch for one minute. And I did, and it felt great. And I actually probably did it for two or three minutes. And the idea is now I'm going to do this every time after my walk. So the idea is that you, when you decide to do it, you do it every time, even if it's just one minute, you get your mind body system into doing it. And we can usually talk ourselves into doing things for one minute. So we, we get our mind body system into doing it. Here's some more hacks with atomic habits that were defined by um, James Clear. You decide on the habit you wanna develop. Okay, so if you wanna center daily, and I usually have a bunch of these that I'm trying to do, right? So that are related to health and fitness and being kind and stuff, but I focus on a couple. So now I'm gonna be adding stretching, right? Start to identify yourself as someone who regularly does the habit. So you wanna shift from an identity of, I always procrastinate to, I'm someone who get my work done. I'm the kind of person who decides to get my work done. Okay, and you're going to shape yourself into that person. So you want to start to get used to that identity. It's a change in how you see and perceive yourself. And then this idea of habit stacking. I love this idea where you pair the habit with something you already do. You pair your new habit with something that's already an established habit. So you you combine them. I started meditating by I would always lay down for a little while in the afternoon and um, early evening to transition from like work to the evening, which often was work too, but, but still to just take a break and transition. And I would listen to, you know, talks on YouTube, comedies, I just relax, right? And I used to think, oh, I shouldn't lay down and meditate, but I scrapped that. I thought, you know, I'm not gonna fall asleep, I'm gonna meditate. So I started adding it to my lie down, my afternoon lie down. And that's how I was able to begin to develop the practice and now it's, I, it's very easy for me to do regularly. So you pair with something you already do. Use visual cues to remind you of the habit, like pictures, post-its, screensavers, reminders, notes, objects, you know, that remind you. We surround ourselves with things that, um, that send a message back to us. You know, when I look at a particular object that I cherish, it, it triggers a, a memory cue inside me of the feeling of that. So that's that idea of surrounding yourself with things that trigger the behaviors that you want. We're veg very visually oriented. If I open the fridge and there's something sweet in there, I'm gonna go straight for it, right? But if there's nothing sweet in there, then I'm less likely to go for it because it's not there. <laughs> so you also get rid of things, get things out of sight, they, because we're very visually oriented and then make it pleasurable reinforcing and I did that by combining meditation with my something I already associated with pleasure, which was my my lie down, take time out time, right? So I just took a little time and tagged it onto that. All right. So one of the questions in the quiz, which you guys do automatically as part of being here, is which of these tips would help you make meditation a habit? Whoops, sorry about that. I don't know what I just did. Um so which of them would help you make meditation a habit? So you might want to write that in the chat. You can either write which of the tips you might want to draw on. The 1% rule is a tip. That means doing one minute a day, the one minute rule. Just doing one minute a day, setting a regular time every day that you're going to do it every day. 
maybe identifying yourself as someone who takes time to center every day. That's one of the tips. Habit stacking. I'm going to pair my meditation. And, you know, you can pair mindfulness with this too. Like every time you turn on the water, you're going to tune into, you're just going to tune into the water flowing, right? You're going to, you're going to drop your awareness into the experience rather than just, you know, being carried away by the mind, right? Every time you get in the shower, you're going to sink into the experience. When you see a sunset, you're going to sink into the experience. When you see your child's face, you're going to sink. So you can use these kinds of things as a trigger to drop more deeply into the experience. Using visual cues, do you have something around you that helps to trigger that for you, right? Like having our water bottle around is a classic visual cue. And then making it pleasurable or reinforcing, you know, somehow making it something that you want to do rather than that feels like a chore. Okay, now we're going to watch a video by Shauna Shapiro. We haven't seen this, right? No, I don't think so. Um, and it's a wonderful video that I think really gets to the heart of meditation. It's called What You Practice Grows Stronger. All right, and just notice what really speaks to you as you watch this video. What really speaks to you as you watch it? In rush hour traffic, you can remain perfectly calm. If you can see your neighbors travel to fantastic places without a twinge of jealousy, if you can love everyone around you unconditionally, and if you can always find contentment just where you are, then you're probably a dog. <laughs> right? We hold ourselves to these unrealistic standards of perfection, and then we judge ourselves when we don't live up to them. The thing is, we're not supposed to be perfect. Perfection isn't possible, but transformation is. All of us have the capacity to change, to learn, and to grow, no matter what our circumstances. As a professor and scientist, I study how people change, how people transform, and one of the most effective vehicles I've found is mindfulness. My own journey into mindfulness was unexpected. When I was 17, I had spinal fusion surgery, a metal rod put in my spine. I went from a healthy, active teenager to lying in a hospital bed, unable to walk. And during the many months of rehabilitation, I tried to figure out how to live in this body that could no longer do what it used to. The physical pain was difficult, but worse was the fear and the loneliness. And I simply didn't have the tools to cope. So I began searching for something that could help. And eventually this search led me to a monastery in Thailand for my first meditation retreat. At the monastery, the monks didn't speak much English and I didn't speak any Thai, but I understood mindfulness had something to do with paying attention in the present moment. My only instruction was to feel the breath going in and out of my nose. So I began, one breath, two breaths. My mind wandered off. I brought it back, one breath, two breaths. It wandered again, sucked into the past or lost in the future. And no matter how hard I tried, I just couldn't stay present. Now this was frustrating because I thought meditation was supposed to feel like this. And instead it felt more like this. <laughs> Right? Being present isn't so easy. In fact, check it out for yourself. I've been speaking for about three minutes. Have you noticed your mind has wandered? All of our minds wander. Research from Harvard shows the mind wanders on average 47% of the time. 47%. That's almost half of our lives that we're missing, that we're not here. So part of mindfulness is simply learning to train the mind in how to be here where we already are. Like right now, let's practice together. Allow your eyes to close and just feel your feet on the floor. Wiggle your toes and sense your whole body sitting here, softening the face, softening the jaw, and notice that you're breathing. Feeling the breath as it naturally flows in and out of the body. Just being here. 
And as you're ready, taking a deeper breath in and out, allowing your eyes to open. So back at the monastery, I was trying hard to do just this, to just be present. But no matter how hard I tried, my mind kept wandering off. And at this point, I really started to judge myself. What is wrong with you? You're terrible at this. Why are you even here? You're a fake. And then not only was I judging myself, I started judging everyone, even the monks. Why are they just sitting here? Shouldn't they be doing something? <laughs> Thankfully, a monk from London arrived who spoke English. And as I shared with him my struggles, he looked at me and said, oh dear, you're not practicing mindfulness. You're practicing judgment, impatience, frustration. And then he said five words that have never left me. What you practice grows stronger. What you practice grows stronger. We know this now with neuroplasticity. Our repeated experiences shape our brain. We can actually sculpt and strengthen our synaptic connections based on repeated practice. For example, in the famous study of London taxi drivers, the visual spatial mapping part of the brain is bigger, stronger. They've been practicing navigating the 25,000 streets of London all day long. When you look at the brains of meditators, the areas related to attention, learning, compassion, grow bigger and stronger. It's called cortical thickening, the growth of new neurons in response to repeated practice. What we practice grows stronger. The monk explained to me that if I was meditating with judgment, I was just growing judgment. Meditating with frustration, I'm growing frustration. He helped me understand that mindfulness isn't just about paying attention. It's about how we pay attention, with kindness. He said it's like these loving arms that welcome everything, even the messy and perfect parts of ourselves. He also pointed out that we're practicing all the time, moment by moment, not just when we're meditating, but in every moment. We're growing something in every moment. So the question really becomes, what do you want to grow? What do you want to practice? When I left Thailand, I wanted to keep practicing mindfulness and I wanted to understand it scientifically. So I began a PhD program, eventually became a professor, and I've spent the past 20 years investigating the effects of mindfulness across a wide range of populations, including veterans with PTSD, patients with insomnia, women with breast cancer, stressed out college students, high level business executives. And over and over, the data showed two key things. First, mindfulness works. It's good for you. It strengthens our immune functioning. It decreases stress, decreases cortisol, helps us sleep better. When we published our first research back in 98, there were only a handful of studies. Now there are thousands of studies showing the beneficial effects of mindfulness. It's good for us. The second thing we learned was quite unexpected. Almost all the people we were working with, regardless of their age, their gender, their background, were talking about the same thing. This underlying sense of, I'm not good enough. I'm not okay. I'm not living this life right. This tremendous self-judgment and shame. And we all know what they were talking about because shame is universal. All of us feel it. And worse, we have this mistaken belief that if we shame ourselves, if we beat ourselves up, we'll somehow improve. And yet, shame doesn't work. Shame never works. It can't work. Literally, physiologically, it can't work because when we feel shame, the centers of the brain that have to do with growth and learning shut down. This fMRI shows the brain on shame. What happens is, the amygdala triggers a cascade of norepinephrine and cortisol to flood our system, shutting down the learning centers and shuttling our resources to survival pathways. Shame literally robs the brain of the energy it needs to do the work of changing. And worse, when we feel shame, we want to avoid it. So we hide from those parts of ourselves we're ashamed of, the parts that most need our attention. It's just too painful to look at them. So what's the alternative? Kind attention. First, kindness gives us the courage to look at those parts of ourselves we don't want to see. 
And second, kindness bathes us with dopamine, turning on the learning centers of the brain and giving us the resources we need to change. True and lasting transformation requires kind attention. And the monk's words echoed in my ears. Mindfulness isn't just about attention. It's about kind attention. This attitude of kindness wasn't just a footnote or something nice to have. It was an essential part of the practice, a part of mindfulness that's so often overlooked. So my colleagues and I developed a model of mindfulness that explicitly includes our attitude and our intention, as well as our attention all three parts working together synergistically. But simply, mindfulness is intentionally paying attention with kindness. We use this model while working at the Veterans Hospital for a group of men with PTSD. I was shocked to learn that we lose more veterans to suicide each year than to combat. Our soldiers carry so much pain and shame so the intention of the mindfulness group was to cultivate this kind attention, even for the seemingly unforgivable parts of ourselves. There was one man in the group who never said a word, never looked up. Two months passed, he seemed unreachable. And then one day he raised his hand and he said, I don't want to get better. What I saw in the war, what I did, I don't deserve to get better. He then looked down at the floor and proceeded to tell us in great detail what he had seen and what he had done. And I can still feel the horror of what he shared and how his shame filled the room. I looked up to see how the other men were responding and there was no judgment, only compassion on their faces. I invited him to look up and to witness this compassion and this kindness. And as he slowly looked around the room, his face began to soften. And in his eyes, there was hope. The possibility that he wasn't just his past actions, that he could choose differently now, that he could change. And this may be one of the most important things I've learned. It's that transformation is possible for all of us, no matter what. And it requires kind attention not shame. And this kind attention takes practice. It takes lots of practice. I want to share with you a simple practice that continues to help me. Some years ago, I was going through a difficult divorce and I'd wake up every morning with this pit of shame in my stomach. My meditation teacher suggested an explicit practice of kind attention. She said, how about saying, I love you, Shauna, every day. I thought to myself, no way. It felt so contrived. She saw my hesitation and suggested, how about just saying good morning, Shauna? Mm -hmm. Oh, and try putting your hand on your heart when you say it. It releases oxytocin, it's good for you, you know. She knew the science would win me over. So the next day, put my hand on my heart, took a breath and said, good morning, Shauna. And it was kind of nice. I continued to practice. And a month later when I saw her, I admitted how helpful it had been. Wonderful, you've graduated, she said. Now, the advanced practice. Good morning, I love you, Shauna. So the next day, put my hand on my heart, anchored myself and said, good morning, I love you, Shauna. Felt nothing, except maybe a little ridiculous, but definitely not love. But I kept practicing because as we know, what we practice grows stronger. And then one day I put my hand on my heart, took a breath, good morning, I love you, Shauna. And I felt it. I felt my grandmother's love, I felt my mother's love, I felt my own self-love. And I wish I could tell you that every day since then it's been this bubble of self-love and I've never felt shame or judgment again. And that's not true. But what is true is this pathway of kind attention has been established and it's growing stronger every day. So I want to invite you tomorrow to put your hand on your heart and say good morning. And if you're really brave, good morning. I love you. Thank you.
What is it that you most resonated with in Shauna Shapiro's talk? And I'm going to run through a few slides of summary of the talk. She talked about how our mind wanders up to half of our time, sometimes more. And that part of learning mindfulness, what part of what we're doing is we're coming back here instead of being taken on these road trips by the mind. Unless, of course, we want to go on the road trip then it's really fun, imaginative road trips and things like that, right? She talked about how she started to judge herself while she was, she was hearing her mind judge herself. And her teacher responded, you're not practicing mindfulness, you're practicing judgment, impatience, frustration, and then said the phrase that what you practice grows stronger, that our repeated experiences actually shape our brain. And she talked about paying attention with kindness it is not just about paying attention, but how we pay attention with loving arms that welcome everything. And today's meditation by Franklin is just a perfect example of how we can practice that loving kindness meditation. About how important it is to embrace even the messy, uncomfortable parts of ourselves and accept them. And that we can learn to do this in every moment. So there's a question that this raises, and that is, what do we want to grow inside of ourselves? What do you want to practice and make stronger within yourself? Right? I take a moment to reflect on that. You could write it in the chat or on your own piece of paper. What you want to grow within. I know I want to grow feeling good within being less uh, tossed around by the vicissitudes of life and feeling centered within. And I'm moving through life with a sense of well-being, you know, like pig pen has a cloud around him. I want my cloud around me to be happiness cloud or feeling, you know, a pleasantness cloud. And I don't expect myself to feel pleasant all the time. I just want to grow it. So she talked about two effects of mindfulness, that it strengthens immune function and decreases cortisol and stress, helps us sleep better. Um, and it helps to heal self-judgment and shame. These characteristics that when we run from them, they show up in unconscious ways, right? Like eating too much sugar. She talked about how shaming doesn't work because it puts us in a red brain state the fight, flight, freeze of the defensive system. The survival-based brain is oriented toward fight, fight, freeze and isn't in a growth, learn new ways, transform mode. It's in a more of a regressive mode. So that's why shaming doesn't work because it puts us into this red brain state. She talked about the vets meeting together and responding to each other with kind attention. And then our practice this week that's part of our meditation and mindfulness practice. And let's do it right now and just breathe in. We'll say good afternoon and fill in your own name. Good afternoon. Say your own name. And if you want to follow it with I love you, you can. So this morning, I mean, this week, let's take a breath. We're simply going to say hello to ourselves with warm, loving kindness each day as part of our mindfulness practice. So we have two mindfulness practices. One is the attitude of mindfulness that you selected. For me, it was trust, reflecting on that and what that means to you this week and how you can actualize it this week. And then each day, a good morning or a good afternoon or a good evening or all three. And if you're ready for it, I love you, cultivating that well-being within. So now we wanna talk about another phase. We've spent a lot of time doing breathing meditation because soothing and calming the nervous system helps us calm down. But what do we do with all those thoughts that happen? And so we're gonna watch, we're gonna watch a short Headspace video animation about how we can think about those thoughts that happen and how we can work with them when we sit down in the quiet observing the thoughts phase of meditation which we're going to start to do usually with my meditations i start with breath work um, some kind of breath exercise one of the ones that 
I've shared with you and we'll, we'll use them HRV breath or the core breath where you're sort of French pressing things up and down, you're releasing, you know, stressful energy out of your head and then breathing in and release French press, centering it in the core of your body and then French pressing it down. I usually start with one of those, but then I'll move into this period of silence of observing the thoughts and this strengthens our awareness. So let's take a look at this video on Training the mind is often quite different to how people imagine it to be. Maybe they have an idea it's about stopping thoughts or eliminating feelings, but the reality is a bit different. An easy way to think of it is to imagine yourself sitting on the side of a busy road, the passing cars representing the thoughts and the feelings. All you have to do is to sit there and watch the cars. Sounds easy, right? But what usually happens is that we feel a bit unsettled by the movement of the traffic. So we run out into the road and try and stop the cars, or maybe even chase after a few, forgetting that the idea was to just sit here. And of course, all of this running around only adds to the feeling of restlessness in the mind. So training the mind is about changing our relationship with the passing thoughts and feelings, learning how to view them with a little more perspective. And when we do this, we naturally find a place of calm. But we sometimes forget the idea of the exercise and become distracted, of course we will. But as soon as we remember, here we are, back on the side of the road again, just watching the traffic go by, perfectly at ease in both body and mind. Well, you get perfectly at ease over time as we go along and watch the thoughts. It isn't always, like Shauna mentioned, comfortable because of all that you feel like you're being pulled by the thoughts that are happening. So we use an exercise to return home. The idea is that you develop an anchor or you, you establish an anchor. That's just something you're going to pay attention to. I call it a home base, something you're going to turn to again and again. So if you're taken away by thought or by an emotion, you return to the anchor. And people use different things. You can use the sensation of your breath. You can notice where the breath is coming in and out. If you're having breathing problems, it can help to use a sound like listening to putting on an ocean waves or something that you tune your attention, you focus your attention on listening to the sounds. You can use gazing at something like a candle. You can use a mantra that you repeat like OM or love or peace, whatever it is. You can use a combination of breathing and a mantra, which is one that the, um, Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh often talks about like breathing in, I breathe in calm, I breathe out and release tension, or I breathe in love, I breathe out love, right? So that's combining a mantra with the breath. So, um, so you can pick an anchor and you can choose a different anchor or home base, whatever you wanna call it, home base tool, tool to get you back to home base. But the whole exercise is when your mind gets, when you catch your mind getting carried away, you bring it back to home base. You bring it back to your anchor. That is the exercise. And we do that over and over. And what happens is the anchor is awareness. The anchor is this guy. This is you. And But what happens is we get lost in the traffic. Other metaphors than traffic for your thoughts and emotions are things like clouds in the sky, right? All right, so you select an anchor and I'll usually use breath, but next week I'll try using sound as an anchor with you. And so this is Headspace's return home meditation. I'm gonna go ahead and play this for you so that you can see what it's like. He's gonna be using a technique called labeling. It's also called noting. You're noting what's happening. So when, when we observe our thoughts, we'll just go, if we see a thought and we get caught, lost in thought, we'll go thought. So let's take a breath. If we feel an emotion, we get lost in emotion, we just say feeling. And then we come back to our anchor. Okay, so we breathe. Thought comes through, we say thought. And emotion comes through, we say feeling. Right. So we're just labeling it and then coming back. We're just noticing that happen, noting or labeling. So that's how you do that. So you simply are and we can you can get more specific about how you note thoughts and feelings like you can say um, 
That was a worry thought. That was a um, future thought. I thought about the future. That was an idea thought. Sometimes I get idea thoughts and I, I throw them a little box in a box in my head. They're things I want to remember later and your mind will. So put them in your remember later box in your mind, right? So the labeling is just simply noticing and it's one way of beginning to disentangle ourselves from being all tangled up with that traffic. So we'll listen to this return. We'll conclude with this returning home meditation, coming back to home base, coming back to home base. Um, and it goes about 10 minutes. So it'll go a few minutes longer than our 115 allotted time. I just want to summarize this week's practices. This is our last slide before we do it. Let's all take a breath. Will that chest hit the sun? You are doing awesome. You're doing great today. So our mindfulness practice is the mindfulness attitude you chose to reflect upon. And then good morning, good morning in your name. And then follow with I love you if you're ready. And then meditation, daily meditation practice. We want to get that routine going. So that's the first thing, whether it's one minutes or 10 minutes each day, five days a week. That's our goal. Okay, and then last question is your favorite insight from the lecture. But let's just go ahead and do our, our last meditation for the class. So taking some time to get comfortable, whether you're sitting up or lying down. Just going to start with the eyes open. Soft focus, just taking in the space around you in the room, no matter what's been going on, no matter what the mind is stressed with right now, no matter how the body feels, just for a moment, letting go of all of that. Just focusing on the space around you without moving the eyes, just taking in the space. I'm just starting with a few deep breaths, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As you breathe in, just feeling the body expand, the lungs, taking in fresh air. As the body exhales, just a sense of letting go of whatever's going on in the mind, in the body. And breathing in through the nose. And as you Breathe out this time. Just allowing the eyes to close. Feeling the weight of the body press down. Contact the surface beneath you. The mind probably going to be quite busy if it's been very stressed out. Just allow the mind to do its own thing. Not trying to think about it. Not trying to stop the thoughts. Just allow the mind to do its own thing. We're going to bring all of the attention into the body. Notice it. Does the body feel heavy or light right now? Does it feel restless or still? Is there a, a sense of flow in the body or do things feel a little bit stuck in some way? I'm not thinking about it, just noticing the sensation in the body. Starting at the top of the head, just gently scanning down. If the mind's very busy, it feels difficult to, to gently scan down at a slow pace. You can just speed it up a little bit and just go multiple times down through the body. Just noticing what feels comfortable, what feels uncomfortable.
and just allow the mind to do its own thing. If it wants to think about something, just let it think. Right now, just focusing the attention on the body. If you scan, you're starting to become more aware of the breath. You find it comforting just placing your hand on your stomach or on your chest. Just feeling that rising or falling sensation. We're just going to use this as a place for the mind to rest. We can rest our attention. As the thoughts come and go, just allow them to come and go. The moment you realize you've been caught up or swept away by that thinking, just mentally labeling it and noting it. Oh yeah, thinking. And then coming back to the breath again. Or if it's a physical sensation, you just go, oh yeah, okay, it's feeling. Letting go of it. And coming back to the breath again. And as always, if you find it easier, and you're following the breath. You can just count the breaths as they pass. So giving the mind lots of space. Just let the mind do its own thing. If it wants to think, let it think. The only time you need to note is if you have completely lost any attention on the breath, been distracted in some way. Just noticing whether it's thinking or feeling. Distracted you. Letting it go. And coming back to that sensation of the breath again. Noting every single thought or feeling. Just those times you've been completely distracted. Otherwise, following the breath, allowing the thoughts to come and go. Giving the mind lots of space. And so just focus on that physical sensation created by the breath in the body.
just allowing the mind to think. It's almost as though that momentum, that energy, is just expelling itself. Just gently place your hand on the stomach, on the chest, as you feel that movement, physical movement. Body under your head. Just an increasing sense of ease in the body, space in the mind. Knowing that process of letting go. Stress has at least begun, slowly bringing the attention back to the body, back to that feeling of contact, weight, noticing space around you again, any sounds, and then when you feel ready. Just gently opening the eyes again. Ta da! You did it. Way to go, everybody. You stuck with it. You rock stars. You're awesome. Headspace is a great app, and they have um, lots of neat videos, and they have a $12 a year student rate. I will wow. post the link to that in the uh, the um, in the meditation and mindfulness lab for anybody who might want to reference that it's really great thank you all so much for joining here today i know we went over i, I appreciate you to be. my name is renata mcnay